I'm David Cook. I'm, I'm from a law firm called DLA Piper. I've got a job title, legal director, all this sort of stuff. That doesn't matter. What, what I do day to day, though, is deal with incident response. Um, and we act on behalf of the Information Commissioner's Office and, and against the Information Commissioner's Office with cybersecurity data breaches. Um, and most of the matters we deal with, I, I can't discuss publicly, obviously, but it's public knowledge that we act on behalf of SolarWinds for the SolarWinds breach. So it, it, it's that sort of stuff. Um, and so it means that we have lots of contact with organizations that, you know, the worst day of a CISO's life, a uh, cybersecurity incident, uh, and the, the stuff that I tend to advise on comes either within the network and information systems regulations or, or the GDPR, the dreaded GDPR. It's not just about cookies and marketing. It's also about other stuff, which I, which I find quite interesting. So let, let's go through it. Um, what I think is really interesting is it's not going to be death by... You know, PowerPoint and death by statistics, but just bear with me, there's some interesting ones here. So every year, uh, DCMS runs a cybersecurity breaches survey and they ask big organizations about what they think about various things and what their experiences are. And every year, I, I look to see what's going on, and every year, these stats surprise me. Uh, and so this year's one 40% of businesses report of suffering a cybersecurity breach or a successful attack within the last 12 months. A quarter suffer them once a week. Uh, and 77% of businesses say that cybersecurity is a high priority. So far, so good. It's all the sort of stuff we imagine is the case and, and we probably see as the case every day. Only 31% of businesses have got an incident response plan. So there's a disconnect there and it's something I come in contact with all the time. And you'll see it yourselves in, in organizations if, if you work it in relation to incident response, which is you know, there's, there's money plowed into information security and IT security, but that doesn't always translate into where that funding needs to go the most. And incident response plans and understanding what an organization's going to do in, in the event of an incident is a really obvious thing, but vast majority of organizations don't ever actually think about it. So we'll come to it. There's very strict timelines under the GDPR. You've got to report a breach within a very set period of time. Otherwise, you have to explain why you're out of time. Now, the worst possible time to work out how you're going to deal with a breach, who's going to sign off on telling the information commissioner? If it's over a weekend, who's going to speak to the lawyers or the external forensic IT provider? Who's going to speak to the board? Are the board going to get together over Zoom or how they're going to come into the office? And if it's over Zoom, how does that work if the network goes down? All those sorts of questions nobody thinks about up front. They think about that in the event of a breach, in the middle of this, you know, the, 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 the blazing and kind of white heat of incident response. And, you know, that, that sounds over the top, but actually you know, there are times when CISOs are crying during this. You know, it's bad, bad times. So do all that work up front. That's easy to say, isn't it? The reality is the vast majority of organizations don't. And, and that's, that's what I want to tell people to do. I've told people to do it for five years and the stats are not changing. So I'm not affecting the results of these surveys. But I think this, this is an interesting topic. So what do we see in reality? And you know, you, you guys can be familiar with this stuff, but on the left there, we've got the event. So the threat actor establishes access to a network. We've then got the detection point. So it's recognized and it, it's known as an issue and that's, that's then triaged. Uh, we've got reporting to the regulator or data subjects. Data subjects is a GDPR term. It means the individuals involved. We've got containment, so vulnerability and threats removed, and on the right, remediation. Now, in reality, this, this phase, this latter half, that's all within the same thing. You know, once you report to the regulator, they then want to know about all this other stuff. When I say regulator, I mean the Information Commissioner's Office. But that could also be the case for the FCA, if it's a FCA-regulated firm. And that could also be uh, some of the utility sector regulators. So... Regulators are on top of this straight away because they see there's an issue and people are at risk. Uh, but what does the GDPR say about this? Now, look, it's not going to be a legal lecture, but the, the, the difference between event and detection. So when, uh, when a threat actor establishes access to the network and when it's spotted, that averages out of around three months. Now, the, the GDPR doesn't explicitly talk about what that phase should be, but it does say that organizations should know what's going on on a network. The information commission gives uh, public lectures and seminars all the time, and if you go wrong, they say, well, we told you about this, oh, this is where it's going to be. If you 
could see it suggests that you should know about the computer science. And what the information actually says is people should have organizations should know if something's gone wrong with the network, should know quickly. The FCA says for an FCA they should know within a matter of hours. That, that phase there at the start about three months. It takes three months for an organization to notice that's a threat after a network of penetration or intrusion and laser loss in some way. So that, that, that's concerning. So organizations on the back end. She can't really fade when it comes to cyber security. It says you should have appropriate technical or organizational measures. What's appropriate to help them? So that's all for grabs, but if there's a data breach you're on the back foot or it's just part of the mission. So detection to reporting, so spotting what's happening to telling the regulator GDPR says 72 hours, 72 hours should be coming from aware of the incident to telling people about the incident. And, that, and that, that's a squeeze time frame because that, that's not working hours, that's you know hours. If it happens on a bank holiday weekend, if it happens over Christmas, and these things can absolutely do. And then that that just allows to cut right down. That, that's the problem. So, so, so again, once an organisation works out it's happened, the clock starts to tick, and the information commission in this country, or the ALDA in Germany, or the Canadian you know, you know, in France, or the regulators specifically ask, when did you find out about this incident? And if you're late, why are you late? And the GDPR says the fine for that if you're late, fires up to two percent of annual global turnover. Come on to why you may think wrongly that these regulation fines don't matter. We've never seen any fines in practice. The GDPR says, the law says, 2% penalty if you report out of time, but the 2% penalty. So it's a concern. We see organizations try and move that slider. You know, we, we can say we found the issue far sooner. It makes that lag time between detection and reporting greater or the other way. So, so we see some manipulation there in practice. And what this comes down to is, once you report, you think, oh, okay, the they say, what security control do you have in place? And, and, and is that appropriate? Bearing in mind, you've got a breach. So you're on the back foot. And then they ask you what you need to do to remedy it. So you can tell people, you can tell data subjects, you can make it public, you can get compensation, you can do remediation schemes. And you go to ask you the question about the same remediation. <laughs> so at the point of reporting, you are talking about something that's already right, been a breach in the past. And you are then saying, and in order to demonstrate that we have appropriate security in place, we've got these plans to contain and remediate the issue. And that demonstrates your uh, position around cybersecurity and your, your posture. If, if you come at the information commissioner and say, this issue's happened, it was a criminal, it's not our fault, we're not going to do anything else because what more could we have done? The information commissioner will go mad and you will get an audit and you will get uh, technical teams asking you lots of difficult questions. If you go and say, we know what the issue was, multi-factor authentication was set, but we could have had uh, localized access controls, some, a, a more sophisticated picture, not, not very sophisticated, a more sophisticated picture, that, that then you can see how the information commissioner, or whatever regulator we're talking about, could be more relaxed about that. But, but the point is, the, the real issue is, the event to detection, that's too long, three months is too long, but we're not going to change that very quickly. That's a, a cultural thing. Cybersecurity culture is a very difficult ask. But detection to reporting, you see that around two weeks after incidents detected to be reported, and organizations are routinely out of time, and we have to find uh, a justification or a way that we can say the point of awareness was perhaps at a different time that reflects better on the organization. But the reason that protection to reporting time is so long is because organizations don't know what to do. What information do we need? Who's going to give it to us? And who's going to put their neck on the line and sign off on this? That is what takes the time. And it's those questions that can be done up front. And in other more mature just um, jurisdictions around cybersecurity, so particularly in the US, so California had the first mandatory breach notification law in 2001. So Americans are good at this stuff. And what they have there is routinely have incident response plans in place and all this sort of exotic language like wargaming and playbooks and things that make sense on paper, but do people really do it in practice? Well, in the US they do. Here they don't. And I think that this is an area that if it's tightened up, will will move organizations from a position where they are rushing to get the information out the door and making mistakes and inviting regulatory scrutiny and data protection compensation claims and all the 
bad stuff you see in the newspapers. You know, I, I despite my accent, work in Manchester, and we had a, a large retailer, a supermarket had a breach, and within 24 hours there was a, a full-page advert in the Manchester Evening News saying, have you been affected by this data breach? You can claim £5,000 compensation. It was a, a, a figure out of thin air, but a compensation class action, and again, look to the US for what compensation class action looks like. We're going to see the same sort of thing developing here, and we are. And some of this stuff, you know, the, the law what in, 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 in the black letter law on paper and what we see in practice can be different, and regulatory fines will come on to, and 4% of annual global turnover, we don't see anything like that in practice. But that compensation bit, we are seeing that. Well, and we're seeing a, a growing culture around compensation following the data breach. And that, that is the bit, and this links in with that, but that's the bit I think is scary. Mm -hmm. So, GDPR, we got all that rubbish through our emails a few years back. Will you consent to allow marketing to continue and all this sort of stuff? The GDPR is about much more than that. But, uh, and, and it's this bit in the middle here. So, GDPR talks about accountability, being able to prove compliance. From a cybersecurity perspective, it's being able to show how your security was uh, appropriate and how you can justify it. So, it's stuff like, have you had audits? Have you had pen tests? Have you uh, had a program of continuous improvements? Have you evolved this over time? Can you demonstrate that you have appropriate security? What's in the market? Is that a sign to end? <laughs> it is a fire alarm. I mean, this session's on fire. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, let's give a recap. It looks like there's more people in before than that. That's great. So what I was saying, right, was that event point, so the threat actor gets on the network to detection takes about three months, and that's massively longer than it should be. And from detection to reporting, which should be 72 hours, because the law says it, the GDPR says it, that takes about two weeks on average. And what I'm saying is the solution is incident response plans. People should plan and understand what they're going to do. Who's going to be the person who calls in the lawyers if it's going to happen? Who's going to be the person to call in the external providers if it's going to happen? Who's going to be the person to sign off? Who's going to stick the neck on line? All that stuff adds to what is taking two weeks and should take sense to us and could do if it's done in a meaningful way where people have thought before it happens how they're going to respond to this sort of incident. So, so, so that, that's where we were up to. And what I was saying was all the bad stuff about the GDPR comes out as a result of it. So the GDPR talks about accountability. You've got to be able to demonstrate compliance in document form. You've got to be accountable. You've got to be able to show how and why you're accountable. And then there's other stuff here which, you know, probably don't need to go into any great detail, but data protection by design and default. If there's a new system, you've got to bake data protection in from the start. Privacy impact assessment, you've got to consider what the privacy risk is and try and reduce it. Transparency, data subject, right? All this sort of stuff. And this is what organizations are spending money on. They're spending money on stuff like how do we deal with data subject access requests? Uh, transparency, how do we tell people what we're doing? Privacy impact assessment, so a document that sits on a computer somewhere saying that when we've rolled out this, um, exposed everything to the cloud, we've thought about what the impact is. All this stuff beneath the hood and hidden away, and then they get pierced by those three things on the left there. So the subject access request goes wrong and you get grassed up. At the bottom, the regulator's doing an audit on your sector, and the regulator's doing an audit on ad tech at the moment, and so they're asking lots of questions and getting into the meat. But in the middle there, personal data breach, you have to go to the regulator. You've got to tell them, we've got some bad stuff going on. And then they ask questions, which can include all this stuff. So all of the, the money that's gone into GDPR uh, remediation and preparation is then potentially undermined by a personal data breach. And I would say, if you go to the regulator and say, we found out about this two weeks ago, we're only telling you now, you're already in a defensive position and you're much more likely to get asked these questions. Because the consequences are, there's criminal offences, Computer Misuse Act, but it happens more than you probably realise. Uh, civil litigation, so compensation claims, 
And then the regulatory enforcement bit, so fines of up to 4% of annual global turnover for the breach, but then also fines of up to 2% of annual global turnover if you report late. They can be combined. You can have uh, 6% or for that reason. We've never seen it. And we'll come on to that. We haven't seen any of this stuff. But it's possible. And if we look further down the road, I think that this sort of stuff is coming up. And the reason is, is this. So, uh, there's some nice little things that are flashing. Let's go on. So over time, we are seeing more penalties issued under the GDPR. So by the Data Protection Supervisory Authorities in this country, the Information Commissioner's Office. So you can see in the phases. So GDPR came in in May 2018. And so at the beginning, there were very few penalties. And this is not cumulative. This is for each period alone. April 2019 to March 2020, big jump. And then an even bigger jump there, I think. So there are more penalties coming up within these time periods than ever before. Um, what is this? What, and the value of them, so the, I mean, it's strange that, that even though there were more penalties for those two initial phases, actually the value didn't really go up. But suddenly, in April 2020 to March 2021, massive, massive increase. What does that tell us? Because people are constantly critical of the Information Commissioner's Office because they've issued relatively few penalties. But they're doing a lot of stuff. There's a lot of investigations. The, the ICO started life, and it's in Manchester. Where I'm, I'm in Manchester, so I'm you know, fond of these guys. But it started life almost like an ombudsman, a nudge. They were nudging you towards compliance. And the GDPR says you've got to have teeth, and you've got to burn your teeth, and you've got to bite on people. They're not really used to that. But they're doing a lot of stuff behind the scenes. Now, what you can see here is across Europe, and increasingly in the UK, the regulators not only bearing a teeth, but they're also crunching down with some fairly, fairly big penalties. But what, what, what's interesting is the Information Commissioner's Office, you know, what, what we've got there is the, the fourth highest penalties imposed in, in, in Europe and the UK for GDPR are UK Information Commissioner's fines. So, so we're, we're not behind the curve by any event. It's just that they're all clustered in two or three penalties, which is, which is not great. Uh, and the top 10 largest fines imposed, now, we've, we've got their France number one, that's Google, 50 million, and, and it goes right down there. But you can see fourth and fifth, we've got UK penalties against British Airways and, and Marriott. And both of those are cybersecurity failings were uh, British Airways, uh, well, and, and Marriott were both legacy systems that were no longer looked at. And, and obviously, if you leave something and you neglect it, security uh, is, is not, patches aren't implemented, security is not updated over time. You can see how things go wrong. Question. The, the issue arising and the the time between the issue. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not a legacy system. You're right. In the, in the penalty notice, it refers to a legacy system, so that, that there may be other points there that I'm not aware of. I, I guess the point is that, that, that the penalties imposed for cybersecurity failings, whatever they look like, and there's a very good point there. I, I think that 42, 42 days is, you know, that, that's justifiable. There are other issues, and the penalty notice is a long notice, and there's quite a lot to look, look at there. But the point is that the regulator, although people criticize it for relatively few penalties, what we're seeing in practice is the penalties is imposing a large, and, and there are lots of open investigations. We know that because we act in, in a lot of these sorts of cases, and the regulator's got a big sectoral focus at the moment, looking at bad stuff that's going on. So after the Cambridge Analytica and Brexit investigation, they then began to look at data misuse in, in a much more holistic way. But they've got all this stuff coming down the track as well. And we know they've got a lot of open investigations for big cybersecurity incidents that you've read about in the news. But um, so going back to the beginning, uh, and probably a good place to stop is we, we've got here that only 30% of organizations, 31% of organizations have got a plan for this. I say, by thinking about this, organizations are not only in a better state to respond if there's an incident, but you probably also see what those failings are. If the person is going to sign off on it as a CEO, does the CEO need to be briefed on cybersecurity and what the issues might be? If you're going to call lawyers, and I talk about lawyers a lot because I'm a lawyer, but if you're going to talk about thir third parties, if you're going to instruct third parties, have you thought about who they are? Have you thought about if the IT director is going to be on holiday, who's going to sign off in his absence? What happens if your network goes down? How do you communicate with each other? Do you have you know, a, a second um, communications network through phones or whatever it might be? 
So I think that's quite an easy step to take. Instant response plan in some form or another is probably a good idea. Okay, we were cut midway there by the fire alarm, but hopefully that's enough of a, a whistle-stop tour that uh, you walk away ready for a beer and happy. Thanks very much. Any questions? Thanks very much. I don't mind having questions at the bar or here. Question. With a great way to do investigations across your different ICM uh, agencies now, uh, the incident investigation is being due to the high attention. Is the investigation they do false and do you have to buy it to do it? Uh, yeah, so that's a good question. So what, what happens is, and this, this is a lawyer thing, I suppose, you have open communications which can be referred to in court or in public, and you have without prejudice discussions, so they are discussions which are uh, aimed to negotiate a settlement, which aren't public. A lot of the stuff in this country happens behind the scenes in that without prejudice bit, which is not made public. However... There are large monetary penalty notices which give lots of information as to what went wrong. And they're worth looking at. They don't give granular detail, but certainly something you can wave in front of the ball. But in the other jurisdictions, so you've got translators is a problem, but you know, the, the French finds a lot of information. And some of the jurisdictions don't publicize the penalties at all. So it varies. But if you want to scare your board and if you want to release funding and, and raise awareness, you, you genuinely raise awareness. British Airways penalty notices and the Marriott penalty notices are, are worth reading. They do give quite a lot of information. Eighty-six pages. Hundred. I've only read half of it. Okay, eighty-six pages. Tough going. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I don't mean misunderstand it. Look, it's, I, I work at DLA Piper. It's the fourth biggest law firm in the world. And it's easy to be seen to be looking down on, on some of the high street firms. And I wouldn't, wouldn't want to do that. But where there are uh, justifications for claiming compensation from these organizations, there are law firms who are looking for that business. And in the aftermath of a big incident, they frequently have Google AdWords and Facebook AdWords and take adverts out in, in, in newspapers. So they're easy to come by. I think it's, I think it's quite scary because there's lots of these claims going on. They settle for about £2,000, £3,000 a pop for each claim. So if there's a big incident that affects hundreds of thousands of people, it could wipe the company out. It wouldn't be allowed to ultimately. But you can see, you can see the risk there. Well, I don't know if it's a fad, but it, it might be a good sign of the future. Maybe in the absence of regulatory enforcement, that is the, the, the mechanism by which cybersecurity is enforced in a way. Maybe. I think it was a question. I think there are any answers. Well, you can ask your question. Okay. Um, it's just something that did come up for a client and there's no way of adding to the other clients. What is actually the difference between uh, an incident as a policy and a plan and a drug look at how do you want to have a difference between the two them? Because the problem is what does that mean? What does the run look at? What does the policy mean? It's quite ambiguous. It is, but whatever it looks like, it's what, what do you do in the event of a breach? I would say a policy is, you know, an organization's policy is we will be transparent. We will report to the regulator. We will cooperate with authorities. And a, and a plan is what you're actually going to do behind the scenes. And a run book or a playbook is how would it work in practice? But whatever the distinction is, you know, planning what you're going to do in the event of a breach, no matter what you call it. Okay. So the, the only, and it was ha how do I see organizations change their approach to cybersecurity insurance? The, big, the biggest thing is ransomware. They are very keen to pay the ransom if they're insured. And sometimes the insurers want them to pay the ransom. But besides that, I, I, don't, I don't really see that, that there's much of a difference. The insurer is breathing down the necks and they've got to be, give updates to the insurer. And it slows things down, but there, there isn't actually much of a difference. It's just a ransomware. Question? Yes, yeah, sorry. Interesting around the defendant versus. Yeah. Yeah, you got, you got to be, so 
I mean, I'd love to give you a legal lecture a bit late in the day, but, but you have to report to the regulator once you are aware of a personal data breach. What does aware mean? And that, that's the bit that I, you know, look at almost every day. So it's once you become, once you have positive evidence that there is an incident which affects personal data. And I think, I think that's the point. And that awareness, when does it crystallize? So that's a difficult question. Uh, you can ask a question. Oops. <laughs> Yeah, so, so for those who don't know, the Information Commission has been replaced with a new commissioner because their terms come to an end. So, you know, nothing suspicious, but there's a new Information Commission. Who comes from New Zealand, the old one came from Canada. Um, is there going to be a difference? I mean, it's not just the person at the top who defines the tone, but the Department for Culture, Media and Sport has not intervened, but has exerted pressure on the ICO. And, and so I, I think, one, we may see more regulatory action, but two, DCMS seems to want to be um, more supportive of, of, of UK businesses and this idea of a digital strategy. So it, it's going to be you know, be more aggressive, but against the, the right sort of organisation. So I'd take it away with one hand and give them the other. So, so I, don't, I don't know the answer. Uh, yeah, so... <laughs> So, I mean, we, we, we are in the midst of all this stuff, so you can't comment too much, but, but there's supposed to be changes about how the GDPR is implemented and what it means in practice and whether you're going to do away with some of these impact assessments ideas. And we'll see how it plays out. I think the GDPR is pretty good. You're all probably sick of it because of the media uh, reporting about the marketing emails and stuff. But when you look at it from the position of protecting data and reducing risk, I think a lot of it makes sense, but it's not fleshed out because there's not been too many cases yet. I think we've probably got time for maybe one more question then. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, not by you, but uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, so what, one more question. Should we do a lottery for it? Okay, no, no more questions then. We're done. <laughs>